Hi, hi, folks. Thanks for uh, inviting us to this. It's always uh, great to collaborate with uh, like-minded folks, and uh, I'm, I've been involved in ESIP for quite a while, and I'm excited to see this uh, collaboration with the Australian group uh, start to form and, and get off the ground. Um, I'm going to be talking about a project called CORDS. It stands for Cloud Hosted Real-Time Data Services for the Geosciences. And essentially, it's a project that's funded by uh, an NSF initiative, the National Science Foundation of the U.S., called uh, EarthCube. And um, essentially, EarthCube was formed in 2011. I'll just let you read this description. I'm not going to read it to you. So it was essentially formed to find um, solutions for software data informatics across the geosciences. And uh, so it's a pretty large initiative. It's been going on for quite a few years and there are a number of funded projects. Our particular project is focused on real time streaming data. And so these are things, um, obviously there, there are cases in, in catastrophes where this real time information is really important. Um, but also when you're doing scientific missions like we do at the lab that I work at, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Earth Observing Lab, we do experiments where we're trying to understand processes better. And so, for example, we have a convective system like the one shown here on the bottom right of your screen that we want to position assets around. We have you know, different aircraft that have different capabilities, you know, high altitude aircraft, low altitude aircraft with uh, special remote sensors on it. And of course, this storm is not cooperating and it's moving and changing, and we need to position these assets to optimize their sampling. So that's another application of real-time data. It's also common for the oceans community to do this sort of thing. Um, and so th that's really a challenge for us. What we've built so far is a display like this. It's an actual display, just a you know, screen grab. Um, our G5 aircraft has a video that shows what the, what the plane is seeing. We have these overlays of satellite information, radar information, lightning detection. You can see here the uh, flight level winds from each of the aircraft. Um, and so they, this is how they're currently guiding the mission. This is from 2012, but the, but it's the display essentially hasn't changed. The, the issue with this is it's great for coordinating. It's about the best we can do, but there's really no data here. This is like a closed circuit TV. You watch it, you, you type in a chat room to try to help direct the aircraft, but there's no data streaming into something like an intelligent system to um, you know, help them uh, guide these deployments in a much more sophisticated way. So that's where our program uh, comes in, is getting access to the real-time streaming data itself. Of course, um, you know, we, we have a lot of those large systems, and um, we, we've uh, made the case to, to the National Science Foundation that many times there are sensor networks in place in a region that's being studied by, in one domain, say, atmospheric sciences. Um, in this case, it was a tornado study in the, in the, in the plains of, of um, the United States. And at the same time, there was, a, there was an infrasound network that was deployed in this area that our atmospheric folks didn't know anything about. And it turns out that those infrasound detection uh, can be used for detecting severe weather. And it would have been a great um, additional resource for us, but we didn't know, know about these data. And we had no easy way to access them at the time either. So we made the case that these that increasingly science problems are interdisciplinary. And um, especially with the expense that we you know, make to deploy all these systems, it's really important that we utilize the, the, you know, all of the equipment that's already stationed out in the field uh, to, get the, to guide the sampling, as I, as I mentioned before. At the same time, there are a lot of these university groups and, and small groups that are designing their own sensors. Um, in the case of this uh, uh, group on the, on the left, they're at the University of Michigan. They're, they're doing um, some really cool stuff with, with water sampling. Um, they'll go out, for example, and you know, they're conserving power, so they'll sample the, the water depths at a, at a very slow rate until a storm comes. They go out to weather underground, look at the forecast, and when a storm comes, they start sampling faster. So they do this adaptive sampling, really cool and innovative stuff. One of our EnviroSensing cluster members is part of this. Um, but they're focused on the measurements, and, and generally speaking, their data is not widely available on the internet. On the right-hand side, we have these uh, weather stations that were printed with a 3D printer, and then the parts are uh, very uh, inexpensive, um, you know, Raspberry Pi computers and Arduinos and that sort of thing. Um, they're bringing measurements to places that never had them before because this weather station is a $300 system. It's not as sophisticated as a $10,000 you know, net station or anything, but it is, is giving some valuable information. And again, um, they're focused, the folks are focused on the quality of these measurements and not so much the downstream use of them and putting them on the net. Um, and then, as Scotty mentioned, there's this whole revolution happening in the IoT world. Um, we did a workshop in Hilo. 
it was a week long workshop and people were developing sensors from scratch right there at that workshop and then going and deploying them in the various ecosystems of Hawaii. Um, and, and so there's just this revolution of inexpensive sensors. There are issues about quality and how you make sense of all this data, but the energy and the excitement from these students is, is really amazing. And again, they're, they're looking at uh, connecting their data to IoT platforms, but those IoT platforms really are lacking some of the metadata that, that scientists might use in acquiring um, and using these data. And so this is a, a, a pretty big challenge to bring in all of these sensors, and especially if you want to try to uh, you know, control the sampling in some dynamic way. And so there are standards that are built for this sort of thing. Uh, one such standard is called the Sensor Web Enablement from the uh, Open Geospatial Consortium. Um, and so uh, if you've ever read some of these standards, you'll find out very quickly that it's going to take you a while to, to grasp uh, and include some of these standards in your own uh, workflow. So um, we realize that most scientists don't have the time to do this. They're focused on the quality of their measurements. And so, um, you, know, to, to, you know, to go and research all of the standards, find out which ones work, is just something they don't have time to do. And that's, that's really where our project fits in. Um, we provide a very simple web services interface to, um, to a, what we call a cords instance or portal that allows uh, people to put their time series data in with just a URL. So if you break that URL down, you'll see very simply, um, this, this was, happens to be an atmospheric sensor. You encode all of the information in the, of, a, of a particular data point within the URL. So the wind direction is 121 degrees, the wind speed is 21.4. You put all this in a URL, you send it to your uh, cords instance, and then one point of data is entered into, um, into your system. Uh, very easy to script up for most of these teams. And, um, and then that gives you access through cords to some more sophisticated tools like these Jupyter notebooks and on our studio um, devices, uh, our studio environment, excuse me. And so um, we make it simple for the, for the folks to get their sensors into a cords instance and then get the data out uh, through, through the same cords instance. Um, we also recognize that uh, assist, you know, getting uh, resources for um, computers can be a struggle for these small groups. And so we've deployed these um, instances in the cloud. So basically, you follow these three steps, get an AWS account, configure, create and configure cords portal, and then start sending uh, data and making it available. Um, the, the, uh, the very low end cord system fits in an Amazon uh, T2.micro instance, which is, for, is free for the first year, and then is 50 cents a, a day after that. Um, so that's for very simple cases. And of course, um, the nice thing about cloud services, you can quickly scale that up to something that's um, you know, more representative of your sensor network if you have one. Um, and so this is the key. If you put your sensor data into cords, we have this philosophy that your measurements are then born connected. They're born connected to all these standards that you do not have to know the details of, but they're evolving and they're very important for um, downstream purposes in terms of understanding these data streams. So um, the ones in, um, in black we've, we've implemented, the ones in green are still to be developed. But for example, there's a, there's a, a, a document called a sensor ML document that will describe what your measurement is, or what's being measured, where it's located, those sorts of things. Um, we use uh, standards where they exist, such as GeoJSON for getting the data out. There's also a standard for uh, CSV files that uh, we employ called GeoCSV. And so, you know, we try to meet the researchers where they are. Many of our research community uses uh, spreadsheets to do their, do their work. And uh, we don't want to prevent that, um, but we do want to add some metadata to those, um, to, you know, to, to, the, to their data streams uh, that make their data more useful. And then, of course, uh, you want to connect these data to uh, very sophisticated algorithms, such as prediction models um, and archives. It's very important to archive these data, and a lot of the small groups don't have um, archiving systems of their own. And so we've partnered with some of the larger archives in the Earth Sciences community to make sure that their streams have a way to get uh, uh, are archived and uh, properly documented. One of the examples, again, of being born connected is there's a, a Google data set search now that's been in existence a few weeks, and um, it uses a technology called um, JSON LD or JSON Link Data and schema.org. Um, you probably many of you are probably aware of this type data set. And so a Cords instance will um, export the uh, information about your sensor network to Google data set search. So for example, if you search for real time weather in Boulder, Colorado, your Cords instance will appear in that kind of search. And so that's something that you get for free when you um, use this um, uh, Cords instance and, and start streaming your data to it. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure we'll have too much time for a demo. I'll, I'll just very briefly um, bring one of our um, systems up. 
Uh, it's these 3D printed weather stations that I told you about. So you can see um, right here, they're scattered about in the Denver, Colorado area, but also um, in other parts of the uh, United States and actually um, some, some global um, uh, instances as well. And these are these 3D printed weather stations that are, that are making measurements that um, haven't been um, uh, uh, you know, made before. And so um, we kind of give you a picture, an overall picture of your, of your map and then um, use what we call a dashboard to kind of give you a sense of the health of your uh, sensing network. You know, you can see that there's some dropouts here um, and here. And so this kind of gives you just an overview of the, of the health of your network. And then you can sort of drill down and, uh, and go into the particular site and then look at the individual variables. This uses um, a technology called high charts. Um, we're all about open source and using uh, open source tools. So you can very quickly get, um, you know, um, live, um, uh, uh, strip chart plots of your data. We also use a free um, package called Grafana to do more sophisticated graphics. Um, this particular um, uh, uh, use is, is a Science Muse Museum of Virginia, and so they want their temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and uh, miles per hour for the wind, for example. So you can really uh, quickly and powerfully customize your um, real-time displays. And then um, you can download these data in the, in the um, uh, forms that I told you about. Uh, you know, uh, GeoCSV, GeoJSON, and uh, and so on. Um, you know, you know, very simply, and it, it can be done with a web service. So that's a very quick overview. But I encourage you to go to the site and play around um, with it yourself to get uh, more information. As I don't have time to go over all of the features. Um, so then, um, I'll just give you a couple examples of where we're using cords right now, and the the, the uh, links to the actual instances. Um, as I mentioned, three D printed weather stations. There. Are, uh, several uh, dozen, a couple dozen locations there. Um, and there, there are also a group that, at, um, the, at NCAR that's, that's doing these. These are open source um, uh, diagrams for the printing uh, of these. So other people can just pick up the diagrams and print them. That's one of the philosophies behind this is that in uh, remote regions of the world, it's difficult to get parts, but if you have a 3D printer, you can print your own parts if something fails. And then and of course things are very cheap. Um, we have a group that uh, is, is providing, you know, placing sensors around a volcano in Tanzania, and um, they're, they're streaming their data into cords. One of the interesting things that happens uh, with this group is they have a real-time display of the, the, these are high-precision GPS and GNSS um, um, you know, measurement systems, so they detect motion in, in centimeter scales. Uh, they have a, a display that, sh that shows continuously in their lab, and they, uh, we're, we're watching the display, and they get alerts uh, through cords. And, and notice this anomaly in, uh, you know, about uh, two years ago that, uh, that then they explored um, afterwards. Uh, we have another group that is uh, putting hail sensors in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So um, if you know, radars are trying to, they try to estimate the hail content of uh, convective systems. And then these sensors on the ground uh, basically measure um, hail, uh, hail hitting the ground. And so they're ver wanting to verify that the hail that hits the ground is actually what they estimated in the clouds. Um, that's a group from the Colorado State University. And then we have this group at the University of Michigan that I talked about previously. Uh, Matt Bartos over here in the, in the left is one of our EnviroSensing uh, uh, student fellows. And um, they, they did a, a workshop uh, where they brought in uh, people from, uh, from all over the um, uh, hydrology community. And we, right there at this workshop, um, you know, programmed the chips, designed the, the not designed, but put together the, um, the instrument package. We, we provided cords instances for each one of these people. And then we connected that stream to the archive all in this um, four day um, workshop. So from end to end kind of sensor development uh, there to demonstrate the utility and ease of use. So this is kind of the ecosystem we see ourselves in. We see a lot of um, folks just, you know, building their own sensor systems and, and creating their own, their own instances. But of course, to make sense of this data, you need some sort of services to visualize and map and, uh, and process these data. And then you want to connect them to other uh, efforts and algorithms and then make sure that these data are, are archived. So um, a lot of times we're really focused on this left uh, part, the pink part of our screen, you know, getting more and more um, use cases of data to prove that it can work across the geosciences. And I, I would say we're, we're still in the early parts of this um, right-hand part of the diagram. Who are the users of these data? Who are making sense of these data? I, I would say myself, it's kind of early days 
for uh, for that at this time. But as as um, you know, Scotty mentioned, there's really an explosion in the amount of sensors and data that's streaming in uh, these days. So here are some uh, observations that um, and lessons learned from the project. Uh, we've definitely learned that there are commonalities of um, of real-time data across the geosciences. Um, you can make a generalized time series interface that uh, it, it really can be agnostic to the type of data that you're sampling. Um, sometimes some of the hard parts are it can be difficult to navigate which standards to employ and in part because each community has their own set of standards. There's one set of standards for the hydrology community that may not match the standards in atmospheric sciences or solid earth sciences and so on. So we've tried to um, do the best we can to accommodate to, uh, as many of those as we can. And, and one really particular example is controlled vocabularies. Um, you know, you'd like to have similar names for things that are being measured temperature instead of temp, for example. Um, and so what we've chosen to do is pick um, comprehensive vocabularies that then map to these other um, subset uh, vocabularies. Um, it's, it's, you know, as soon as you start to work with the data providers, uh, you learn very quickly that they have some kind of unique needs. And so you're always kind of balancing their unique needs with what you think the needs of the community are. I'm sure uh, people who run projects like this understand that, uh, that issue. Um, this, this enthusiasm among the, among the small sensor community is really infectious. And um, I mean, at this workshop in Hawaii, the students were out there at midnight deploying sensors in ditches uh, in Hawaii. And uh, the energy there is just really cool. It's really, really fun to be a part of. Um, and, and so that, that's one uh, observation. And then, as I mentioned, it's still early days for the, for the use of this sensor network. Um, we, have a, we have a goal to work with high bandwidth data, such as imagery and high rate time series. Um, but uh, those can bring another set of challenges in terms of bandwidth limitations. Um, and so we have some ideas on how to scale that back. And in terms of quality control, it's really this ESIP sensor, sensor dat lab that Scotty, myself, Matt, and Renee um, have put together to look beyond just uh, sampling the data and look at, at common quality control algorithms. And then the last thing is sustainability um, is, is really an issue for projects like this. We have a three-year grant. We're in our final year of that grant. Um, we put everything on GitHub and we practice open source philosophies, but uh, we need to make sure that this community remains supported beyond the life of this grant. And so that's, uh, that's our project. Here's our team. Uh, I wanna note that this, this picture of me is on the left. Uh, it was when I had to attend a lot of management meetings and I kind of turned into a hippie, you know, more of a hippie than like this. Uh, so if you ever see me, uh, I look, look more like this now. But um, here, here's some links to the to the project, and I'd be um, happy to answer questions and and or um, uh, uh, correspond via email. Thanks.